Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's the interview series presented by WFPK and WFPK.org. Consequence and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks as always for making your way here for checking out the series. Of course, you know what to do if you like what you see, what you hear. Hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week. So it's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists. And I'm so excited today. Modi is here and he's got a brand new special called Know Your Audience. Hello. How are you? It's so good to be on. Wow, what a great, what a, how you do that. The introduction is so good. On my podcast, when I sit there with a guest, I, I fumble and mumble and, ugh. You know what that is? Bravo, bravo on the introduction. Good. <laughs> you know what that is? That is now six years of saying the exact same thing except the name. Okay. And, <laughs> and I don't know if you like this, but uh, even though the rest of it is just like, it's, you know, I've, that's a muscle memory. I've got the name next to me. And I, we've yeah. talked about it. It doesn't matter who I'm talking to. It's like, and I'm going to fumble on the name, though. It's It could be oh, my mom, and yeah. I would feel like that I'm going to mess it up now. I've gotten yeah. this far, all this, and I'm going to yeah. right there at the end. So Yeah. <laughs> well, like, I, I mean, you you introduced your own show amazingly. It's a, <laughs> so that's a, that's a big thing. Sometimes they, when, you, when they do an introduction to somebody, it sounds like they're doing, I've literally walked on stage and grab the mic out of somebody's hand while they're introducing me, because it literally sounds like a a, a hespit, a, a, um, a a eulogy, uh-huh. like it's a eulogy. Like, what are you saying? You've seen him or you haven't seen him? Here he is, Modi. That's all you gotta say. <laughs> we feel so bad today. That <laughs> yes, <laughs> he was. That. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let me tell you first, uh, the new special, Know to Your Audience, was so funny. And I do say that coming from non-Jewish person. And uh, and 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 that's, I mean, that's the trick of it, right? You named it, you must have named it Know Your Audience for a reason. Maybe we should start there. <laughs> like, because it is, this is, this is, you know, you have a very Jewish personality in your comedic <laughs> personality. Yeah. But you still find ways to play to everyone how, how how do you do that it's um it's it, you, you know from working in at places like the comedy cellar where it's a diverse crowd of from all over the world in one room and then you do uh private jewish events and you do your own show where people are coming just to see you where it's jews and jews that bring like you got to see this guy he's funny just like you see chris rock you see chris rock you have a portal into the world of uh a black uh, of the of the black world and what they go through and what they experience and and you know and this is the same thing it's a a portal into the Jewish world through laughter and pride and people you know love it and I I you know I I, I was a big fan of Jackie Mason and I always saw that he was he was true to his audience and the rest followed you know he had a Broadway show for three years where people nonstop and it wasn't all Jews but the, he was so Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard you talk about some of your influences before. And uh, b- besides uh, Jackie, you've mentioned uh, Don Rickles and um, we uh, in our house, we have a running, I don't want to say joke because I don't want to break my wife's heart, but the joke is he's still alive and she, uh, he's her best friend. So I can never, ever say that Don Rickles has died. So he's very much alive in our house. So it's uh, when wow. I heard you say what's that, the that reason sort of, for that? What's, what's that? The, what's, what's her connection to Don Rickles? That it's, uh, she, uh, there's no reason let you know, go. you're in a relationship quirky things coming and, and long running jokes you know will start to happen but i hadn't heard anyone bring him up lately when i heard you saying like he was a bit of an influence on you as well i was like oh that's i love hearing that yeah because you, i can i can tell that part of you as well it's in, especially in the way that you work the audience yeah uh, no, it's uh, he's he, he was a little bit of a shock value type of a thing he was uh you know edgy and a, and a racy little racist racy way sometimes um not sure you can get away with it today or you want to it's not necessary but he was um it was and it was spontaneous it was fast it was quick it was an eye gesture it was so strong he's amazing i learned so much by watching him yeah it's so your background and that's where it gets interesting to me how you ended up where you ended up because as your story goes uh you you got into banking right it was banking first and then you had some friends that kind of pushed you into doing some stand-up and 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 it works and yeah this is like 30 years ago i was at investment banking at merrill lynch and um i it was the international division i used to come home and hang out with my friends you know and 
imitate all of the secretaries that I worked with. And my friends were like, this is so funny. You should be doing this on stage. And they set up an open mic night. And I showed up from work. And I had a suit and the whole thing on. And I, I did it. And it was like the, the owner of the club said, you should work on this. And, and I caught the bug. And I was working both jobs for a while. And then like five years later, no, like six, six years, I quit full time. I was become full time. Com- I was really a full time comic before. I was working every night and every weekend. I was on the road and then the bank. And um, and then I just, I quit and uh, with no regrets, happy as hell. Yeah. Well, that's it. So once it happens, once you, as you said, you get the bug, like, does it, do you, do you find your natural voice? Do you start, you know, studying the masters? Like what, what happened there? I So it's interesting you say study the, the masters. Uh, so so this is, you're talking about 1994-5. There was no YouTube and there was no Instagram and Facebook. I sound so old right now, but I fell in love with a comedian. Now, now keep in mind, I wasn't in the comic world. I, I never wanted to be a comedian. I never watched comics and was a huge fan. Once in a while, HBO aired uh, George Carlin. They aired Bill Cosby. They aired, you know, whatever they aired. And that's what I caught, you know, because it was on HBO. I was never a huge fan. But then I saw Alan King, which uh, resonated so much to me, his cadence and styling. And I said, how do I watch this? And there was on 52nd Street, there's the Museum of um, Broadcast and Film, where you literally had to go and like say, I want to get all of the, and they put you up in a little, in a little booth and, they, and you can watch all of the, everything he ever did. And um his cadence and his timing and his his pride and his elegance. And it's like, he comes from a place of wealth, not a place of I'm starving artist. It's like, I, I said, this is it. And that was like the styling I, I, that I really, really copied the most. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a funny, and then, and then finding your own voice in that. I mean, once you... So, like, so finding your own voice, just to keep in mind, when I first started doing comedy, it was all these over the top, secretaries and characters the latin secretary the gay secretary the the uh it was a portuguese that was, i was doing all these it was so over the top and then when you begin to find your voice the voice became very jewish very very <laughs> jewish once you calm down a little bit and once you begin to get your cadence and what's happening the voice started coming out and it became very Jewish and it was a gift because then I was able to work all kinds of Jewish gigs and I was always clean so I got all kinds of corporate world work um I had a stent where I was doing all the comedy clubs with uh with a with a group of Howard Stern guys uh Sutter and John and all. so I got to experience the comedy club world too but I was very gift I was very blessed that I was able to do corporate gigs and Jewish gigs and you know a little better than just doing, you know, Uncle Chuckles at uh, in uh, in Des Moines, you know, for for from Thursday to Sunday, right? Because you still have to be funny, but you have this benefit of of sort of having a, a built in audience. Like I'm thinking, like Christian musicians, like Christian rock stars, have a built in. It doesn't matter how good the song is, you have the people still clap. That doesn't work that way with comedy. You still have to be funny, but here it is. Like the room is still packed. Oh, yeah, you have to be a built in Jewish audience is one thing, but now it's a Jewish audience, right? If you go up there with some horrible jokes, they will let you know that your jokes are horrible. It's not a bit. It'll be built until you don't until they're not your audience. But thank God you saw the special. They love it. It's I, 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 I it's I, I'm so blessed with my audience and so blessed that now I have non-jews and gays oh my god how amazing is that gays are coming to the show that that really means you've made it that is really a sign that it's coming along we'll show up for you that's yeah <laughs> whoop so so that's so you've been doing this for a while now i know this is the obvious question why did it take till now for you to finally do a special i will tell you um i've been doing comedy for 30 years uh, almost almost and um Maybe a little more. I, I I judge my beginning of comedy when I was passed as a comedian at the Comedy Cellar. And that was in April 94. Mm-hmm. And actually in April, I'm doing a uh, two shows there to, 
to commemorate my um, my my 30th anniversary. But I always worked. Um, I I just never really aligned with a manager and an agent, and 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 everything changed after COVID. You know, during COVID, my husband, who was you know we were living together, obviously, and he began to take over my career, and he found the right agent and found the right um, a, a, a publicist and the right people to do the the special with and he put it all together I was it, it was um it, it was just a uh it, it was you needed help I needed the right help and he was that right help and he made it all happen yeah, yeah. the importance of finding a champion you know yeah. you can give all the career advice I think that you you you, you want to but at, at the end of the day it's like most of the time you got to find a champion somebody that's yeah you got it you've got it you can't do it alone you cannot do it alone yeah so you finally this you know here you are and 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 you do the special do you make the choice all new material do you take the chance to do some of the greatest hits the special was uh it was uh i literally prayed for what material to to put in i wanted to show the jewish world and the fundraising and how many events we have and whatever the problem is whatever the charity is it's sad and it's not uh, and it's, it's it's a disease and they still bring comedy into it it's such a jewish perspective on on the world you know during the war now there's comics making jokes and having fun with it and relieving stress i wanted to show that i wanted to show the pride in in the Jewish world, you know, with the Jewish ambulance, for example, that people see them but don't really know what the hell it is. Again, it's a portal into the Jewish world through laughter and pride. And then just, you know, over the top characters of like the honorees at these events. And then I went into my personal life, being married to, to, to my husband, Leo, but it wasn't so much gay material, if you caught it, it was more being married to a millennial. Right. Because there's that big age difference we have, and then um, and and it's just uh, it, it again, it was just uh, it's it, and I discussed anti-Semitism, and um, and it you know we taped it actually a year and change ago, so it was like a it's a little bit not dated, but I just I talk about COVID, you know, there's a little and now everybody already forgot about COVID, but there's a little bit of you know of that sprinkled in there and um. And just like, you know, I'm weaving in, there was, there was somebody in the audience that wasn't Jewish, and I'm doing the whole show, explaining the whole show to them. And, uh, you know, there's always the token goy in the audience, the one non-Jew in the audience, and um, or, or, or many now, but uh, I had many to pick from to, to work with. And uh, you kind of do the whole show for that person. And it's a whole element of explaining to them the joke, and that, and that within that, there's a joke. Yeah, and that's, the, so that's a really great, talent but that's got to be a trust fall because how much of your show are you planning on that person being there whoever that person is like do they have to like god i hope there's a non-jew in the crowd tonight <laughs> because no they, there always is. works there always is there always is and they're always great and they and i always give them the yarmulke at the end and i it's a whole yeah there's, there always is and if there isn't i just keep going without doing that extra layer of explaining a joke yeah, which makes you know, it so fun, though. I mean, the the extra layer it really does. I mean, you get two laughs out of one joke right there. Exactly, literally. Which, by the way, you tell a joke at the beginning, uh, you know, where God looks down and says, "You'll never believe it." Um, and I thought, how rare it is to actually hear a comedian tell a joke. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I sprinkle them in. They're amazing. Um, my next hour now, I, I really sprinkle them in. You, you know, I, I do shows all over and I do in Florida, um, the big market. And there's like, there's the Florida now is like, you have young and hey, we moved here after COVID, we love it. And then you have like, you get in front of an audience where the average age is deceased. And like, and when you do these jokes, I could do my material and all this genius way I'm looking at everything. And then you just do a joke, joke, and they die. Yeah. They, you see them hurling over, and um, you saw the in in that in that you know. And then you just, I, I now like I, I massage my material into the joke and makes it make it less of a a joke, joke. 
but still that punch of it. It almost feels like a lost arts. You know, that's, yeah. that's why it shouldn't have felt out of, it, it didn't feel out of place. I shouldn't have been surprised. And yet there it was, it's like, oh, wow, a joke. A joke. You know, yeah. so much as observational usually with stand up and, and to actually get like, you know, a structured something is like, I loved it. I laughed and I told my wife the joke afterward, like the way you would tell a joke, you know. It exactly. Yeah. I have I, in my new hour that I'm working on, I have a few more of those because people just love it. Also, when they, you know, after you watch someone special and they go, oh, he talked about how the plane didn't take off, but they did, they had a delay. I forgot what it was. But if you have a joke joke, I saw he had a joke that was great. And you went and you told your wife and that was the, you know, it's like, a, it's like yeah, he, here's something to take home with you. Here's, here's a little, uh, a t um, uh, uh, what's it called? A uh, gift bag. Right. I pass along your business card. Is what exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You are really good at reading the audience and working the audience. Was that, was that always a talent that you had or is that something you developed later? I, I don't know. I just, I, that's why I call it know your audience. I can look out and see exactly what material to do. I can see uh, who's laughing, who's not, who's, who's, I can literally look out and see who's going, whose brain is somewhere else completely. Um, and you can see how far you can go with whatever material you're doing, especially if you're doing Jewish material. If you're doing it at the comedy cellar, I don't do Jewish material, but the material I do is being presented from a Jew. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, but it's got to be material that they understand. It's got to be, you know, right. common ground, you know. So, I mean, they even pull it off, as you said, in places that you wouldn't usually do comedy and the stuff that you are doing, talking about the war. I mean, that people are justifiably very emotional about that topic. How tricky is it then to find the comedy in it? Um, e e so recently... And the comedy special, don't forget, was filmed a year ago. But now when I'm on stage, I don't talk about the war until the end. I want to give them like an hour and 10 minutes of just like, oh, just like, no, there's no, okay, we're just laughing and we're wherever he's going. And at the end, I, have an, I, I address it with a joke. Um, you know, when the war began, I was in Israel. Uh, I was there the day the war began, and um, we were staying at the Satai Hotel, and um, Bruno Mars was staying there as well. And uh, they, um, we watched him being taken out to be, to to go to a private airplane and get whisked out of Israel. We had a flight on Air France that evening, um, but uh, I said to my husband, "I go, thank God they got him out of the hotel." And he goes, "Why?" Because uh, if a bomb hits this hotel and me and Bruno Mars die, I will get zero press coverage. <laughs> and just little things like that. And then I bring it all a little bit more and a little bit about, you know, different anti-Semitism stuff I'm talking about. And then I sing the Hatikva with them. And you know who loves that the most? Hatikva is the Israeli national anthem. It's hope. The word, the word means hope. And it's such a, uh, an amazing song. And the people who aren't Jewish enjoy it the most. Really? Why do you think it, that is? I don't know. They DM me. I never heard the song. We Googled it. We love it. It's The words are amazing. We were so happy you ended the show with it. You know, John McClaney. You know, it's like, out of, I'm like, what? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it was just, a, you know, the, I was doing shows on Monday after the war began. Because we flew to Paris. I had four sold out shows. So I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm not going to cancel these shows. Um, and we, I just added that Hatikva at the end to, to sing that Israeli national anthem. And it was just, wow, I haven't stopped doing it. It's just been going great. I think that's yeah. what we usually see. I mean, you even hit on that uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the pandemic, with COVID, like how quickly we need comedy. Oh, like, yeah. You, you joked about how quick you were back doing shows. Yeah, during that time. COVID was, uh, oh, 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 yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that. No, the Jewish people were like, yeah, the, the pandemic and the, uh, what's it called, the lockdown, the uh, quarantine, the quarantine, who the, wow, could you remember, you believe we don't remember the words anymore? The quarantine, Gone. Jews were like, every, they, 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 they didn't, we were just, I was doing private shows and all of this stuff, I talk about it in the special. <laughs> I forgot about that. We talked about it in the special. Yeah, it was Jews were like, okay, yeah, great quarantine. We can have a little party, but so okay. 
So I, I was, it was funny because I was, I was working so hard during the pandemic. We were doing, we set up an entire studio in the house for Zoom shows. It was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Do you know a Zoom show? How horrible it is to do comedy like this? Because you get nothing in timely matter at all. But I'll tell you a trick I learned. So um, I was watching um, Martin Scorsese mm -hmm. did this thing with Fran Lebowitz. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? Yeah, the uh, the, the show uh, Pretend It's a City. Yes, Pretend It's yeah. a City. I'm watching it and I go, oh my God, I got it. I got it. It's only them two. Uh -huh. And anything she says, he bursts out laughing in a way as if he had a problem. Like, 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 like he might not be well. That's how hard he was laughing. So then we were doing these Zoom shows. What I'm telling you, there were over, over a thousand people on the Zoom show. You know what I'm talking about? It was, like, it was some organization. The organizations had to keep the, 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 the members engaged. So I would do a show. I would put three people on the... Um, on the screen, the rest were muted. And I told them, you are the laugh track. Every time you hear the joke, you have to laugh like you have a problem. And, and it began, it be, and I built an entire audience from New York in Australia, and uh. in, in, in England. And now I'm doing shows there, for, I'm doing the Palladium there. I'm, I'm, I'm flying to Australia in August in, from that. From and, the laugh um, track. That's why laugh track, that's why they always worked. But it, it's a real laugh track. Someone's like, it was, it, it's just, just like you and I are now, everybody else right. is watching, but they only see me, the president, uh, the rabbi, and one more person, and they're laughing. And so you don't hear cats coming in. You don't hear the doorbell ringing. It was like, we had to learn how to do it. Um, so that that was during COVID. That was, but people needed to laugh. And, um, and then we had like, I was very lucky because like, some guy who would be like, he was gonna take his wife for her 40th birthday to Europe with all their friends and spend like $2 million, ended up doing a backyard party with me as the main event. So <laughs> it, it was like, there's, there's blessings in the curses. There's blessings in the, yeah. Wow, I yeah. forgot about that. I forgot <laughs> I talked about that in the special. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad it worked out. I mean, seriously. I'm glad because... you got that joke. I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot to that's it's one of those specials that I, I saw once a couple days ago and immediately went I'm gonna need to watch this like at least two more times you oh know, yeah to make sure because you you do you pack so much in there and it's so good and and you know and there's a bit of an education to me as well in the comedy so uh I always appreciate that uh, that's a nice I, compliment and another compliment I've been getting from people now people are seeing this like you mm -hmm. like our, our publicist Rob saw this and he says to me uh, and he's represented represent other comedians. He said to me, this is the first special that I want my parents to see. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> was like I want my parents to see this. Like, he, he has other comedians that he loves that are doing great. But he goes, I wouldn't bring my parents to see them. But this, I would show it to my parents. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice, some kind of compliment in there. Yeah. That's... I find there's a compliment. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> You've also got the podcast. I want to hit that real quick. Uh, yeah. And here's Modi. That's out there. Do you do that seasonally? Is that ongoing? Is that what's we <clears throat> we uh, do once a week? Mm -hmm. It's harder now because we're on um, we're touring, but we when we are in town, we do a bunch and then air them slowly. We had our one hundredth anniversary of uh, and his Modi. We taped it at the ninety second Street Y. It was so much fun. It was such a great episode. And congratulations the on that. Thank you. Nine Second Street Y uh, was great. And um, we've had some amazing guests. And it's and it's and it's literally it's just like for fans who just want to know a little bit more about me, about my our life, our shows, our and then whatever guests we have, it's just me interviewing them. And it's and I never do an interview like I always watch other people's interviews with them and never ask the same questions. Mm -hmm. I I had Alan Dershowitz on and we spoke about cantorial music. <laughs> you know, I um, it's it just like that kind of stuff. I just, you know, those are some of the best ones too. I uh, it was an early career learning lesson. So, congrats on the one hundredth. We just taped our nine hundredth, but I do more. Wow. A week. I do more a week, so I do three to four a week that we release. Um, and 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 it was somewhere early on. I had never done a comedian, and I had uh, a comedian on, and um, I did not know. 
I did not know that trick right there. Talk about something else. Oh my God. Yeah. And how you can do that and how well that works. And yeah. uh, man, just crumbled. The whole thing crumbled, came out of it just defeated and sad and a little bit angry. And then of course you take that and you're like, oh, oh, I see what I did wrong now. And and yeah. when you can pull that off with someone like that, that you do so well, that, you know, you have such a great talent that like, it makes all the difference. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. cause the, because if you if you look at every because everybody's on the podcast circuit on the whatever circuit they're on and you're seeing their interviews and their sound bites, um, we had the uh, I had uh, I I Elon Levy who's like this self-appointed Israeli spokesperson on the podcast and everybody and he's just sound bites sound bites I said stop stop we know right. talk to me are you dating anybody and he's like it's just it's this cute little kid cute little kid like 20 whatever he is he's like I, he's adorable he's a huge hit now with the and i'm just like are you on jade date what's going on talk to me who you're living with it was like that kind of stuff you know yeah <laughs> no well i will tell you i make no apologies about asking about uh, your special on this one predominantly because i loved it so much thank you i honestly did know your audience is so good and uh and modi it was such a pleasure to talk to you thank you so much for taking the time Thanks. And then uh, all of your listeners, it's going to be available on my website, modilive.com uh, on the 18th of this month, which is March. And um, that's it. I look forward to seeing everybody at the show. I always tell everybody, be the friend who brings the friends to the comedy show. If you see a comic near you that you like, if you see me coming, buy six tickets. Don't buy two. Buy six. And by the time the show comes, you'll find four friends that need a good laugh. And so be the friend who brings a friend to the comedy show. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you for uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week. New and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.